Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Sunlight Service. This is Abundant Life Part 2. And uh, I want to kind of start with the end tonight and just lay out what I really want to say tonight is just quite simply, Abundant Life is not your old life with a coat of paint on it. It's not a better quote-unquote normal life. Abundant life is a new life for a new man, or a new creature, or a new creation. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, and the King James, and the Message. In the Amplified, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any person is ingrafted in Christ the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether, the old Previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. So when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is a complete new life. We're not talking about a better old life. We're not talking about all of the situations from your old life, but just a little bit better because you have Jesus. We're talking about something completely new, something completely different, something fresh, something sweet, something exciting, it's not struggling anymore, just holding on until Jesus comes, or all of these different things that we say, but it's something completely new, completely superior, completely abundant. It's, it's, it's living life to, to the fullest, rather than taking life as we know it and trying to make it a little bit better. So in the King James, 2 Corinthians 5.17 reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And again, this is so important to understand that all things are become new. All things in our lives are made new in Him. We're not bringing some of the old, we're not, you know, we're not mixing covenants, we're not a little bit of Old Testament and a little bit of New Testament, or a little bit of Old Covenant and a little bit of New Covenant. All of the old has passed away and all of the new has come forth. And we have to break this mindset of, well, if I can just get Adam to behave a little better, then things will be a little better. Because it's not about Adam. And if we're going to see anything tonight, we're going to see that it's about a whole new man, a whole new creature. It's not about Adam, it's about Jesus. It's not about the world, it's about the kingdom. It's co totally and completely new. There's been a shift that has happened when we got out of Adam and we got into Christ. When he put himself in us on the cross... When, you know, again, when Jesus was lifted up and he drew all man unto himself, when he planted that incorruptible seed in us, and then three days later he rose again, he didn't rise again to the same life that we had had before the cross. He rose again to new life, to abundant life, to resurrection life, completely and totally new and different. Something fresh, not something stale. Something exciting, not, not you know, drudgery, not, not, not being stuck in a rut, but experiencing everything that God has for us to experience. Which, you know, we saw last week, the, the, the thing that God wants us to experience, the, the abundant part of abundant life, it's His love. It's the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of His love. And when we, when we begin to experience that love, that's what it means to be in Christ. It means to know and believe the love of the Father in the context of the Son. And when we know and believe that love, when we truly experience that love, then everything is new. Because everything filters through what you believe. Everything filters through love. Either you want it, but you don't believe you have it, so you're looking for it, you're trying to earn it, you're trying to get it, or you know and believe that Daddy loves you, and you're living out of that love, and instead of trying to get it, you're, you're so full of it that it overflows naturally, and all you can do is share it with everyone else who needs it, which, which really everyone else who needs it is everyone else. So in the Message Bible, it reads like this. Now we look inside, and that's an important phrase because, again, what we saw last week and continuing on to this week is we're looking at the inner man, the new man, the hidden man of the heart. We're not looking at outside circumstances. We're not looking at what we do or what we've done. We look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. And guys, that's what confession is. Confession means to agree with. When we hear what Daddy says and we confess that, when we line up with that unity 
in Him, that's when we get a fresh start. That's when we're created new. It's not saying things are so bad and I hope God can make them a little better. It's listening to the Father who says, I've already made things, I've already remade the world in my image. So when we see that, then we can be that. When we confess that, that's what comes to pass. Because I've preached this before, you know, I've taught this before. Where, where the word of a king is, there is power. And that's who we are. We're kings and priests unto God on this earth. So what we speak has power. What we say gives life to things. In the same way that when God breathed into Adam, it was the breath of life. We still have that breath of life. What we breathe out into the world is what manifests. What we put out there is what you know is really what we create, what we make real. What we believe defines our reality. So it says... Uh, now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone. Again, we're not taking our old life and adding to it to make it better. We're totally and completely getting rid of it so that a new life burgeons. It's not about making your old life a little bit better. It's not about covering up sin so that you stay out of trouble. Uh, the Message Bible says, I believe in the book of Romans, it says, here it is in a nutshell. One man did it wrong and got us into all this trouble with sin and death. But another man did it right and got us out of trouble and into life. True life, real life, abundant life. The old has passed away and the new, behold, all things are become new. So, now I want to back up to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 10. And there's this really interesting story in 1 Samuel chapter 10 where uh, Saul is, uh, he hasn't become king yet, but, but uh, Samuel has, has anointed him to be king and he told him he's going to be king and, and that, that part is coming. And then uh, we see this interesting story where Samuel tells him that he's going to go see a bunch of prophets and he's going to prophesy. And, and listen, I'm not saying that, that your calling or your office or whatever is to be a prophet, but... What I am saying is we all prophesy. That's what I mean when I say where, where the word of a king is, there is power. What we say, you know, in, in large part, it comes to be. If you wake up in the morning and you prophesy, man, today's going to be terrible. Well, it probably will. Because you're putting that out there. You're setting yourself up for that. You're creating that reality with what you believe and with what you confess and with what you prophesy. So again, you know, you don't have to be a prophet to, to draw anything from the story. You just have to understand that, that that's what we do. We are witnesses. We are, you know, kings and priests and prophets, just as Jesus was. So then we get to 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse 6, in the King James it reads, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. And that's important, because this all works through the Spirit. Knowing and believing the love of, of the Father, the love of Christ, the love of God, it can only come through the Spirit, through our love receptor. So it says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Even then, even with, with the human king that God did not want his people to have, he said, I'm going to put my Spirit on you, and you're going to start confessing some things, and you're going to be turned into a new man. Or as the New Testament puts it, speaking of the cross, we were conformed into the image of Jesus. It's no longer, you know, Adam and, and the old man and, and everything connected with that, but it's the new man, Jesus, and everything connected with him. It's no longer the earth realm that Adam was formed from the dust of the ground, and, and then Jesus, you know, was, was from heaven. So we've shifted a whole different realm. The old heaven and the old earth passed away, and behold, a new heaven and a new earth came down from God. So, so what we see is that when that spirit comes upon us, when we understand our true identity, we begin to prophesy, and we are turned into a new man. We are translated out of the power of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and everything changes. Not some things change, everything changes. And the important part of that is that the change starts inside. The change starts with, with this turning, with, with this transformation, with this, this confirm, with, with, with being conformed, as it were, to, to the image of Jesus. When we start to understand who He is in us, then we start to understand that as He is, so are we in this world. When we start to understand that I'm not living an abundant life, but He's simply living His life in me, then we start to understand that it's not Adam plus, 
you know, a little bit of good, but it's Jesus all by himself. It's his life and it's not mine. My life is not my own. I was bought with a price. And, and anyway, I'm dead and my life is hid with God in Christ Jesus. So it's not about me and it's not about what I've done and it's not about what I'm trying to do. It's all about him. It's all about the new man, the inner man. It's all about agreeing with Jesus or, or again, understanding that on the cross we were conformed into his image. It's not about, I have these thoughts and they're bad, so I, so I have to, you know, deny myself and pick up my cross and follow Him. It's about, I have a new nature. I don't have those thoughts anymore. I have the mind of Christ. And I may still, I, you know, I may still have, remember some of those old thoughts and those old moods and those old mindsets. But, but that simply, all of those things simply fall away when we fill ourselves with the fullness of God. When we focus on Him instead of focusing on our circumstances. Because when you focus on your circumstances, it's easy to get down on yourself and on every, anything else, anybody else. It's easy to say, well, look how bad it is, when really all, all any situation needs in order to look better, the only thing it needs is for the light to shine so you can see it clearly. And then instead of obstacles, you'll see opportunities. And then instead of things being bad and getting worse, you'll see that things are, getting, that things are good and they're getting better. You'll see that we're coming into the unity of faith all together, growing up into that one perfect man, that one new man. And again, how do we do that? I believe it's, uh, I believe it's Psalm says, mark the perfect man, and the end of that man is peace. So if you want to stop struggling and you want to have peace, look at Jesus in the mirror, see that he is in you, and when you see that he's in you, then he begins to come out of you. So again, what we see here is, is the Spirit of the Lord causes us to prophesy, causes us to speak the word of the Lord, which the first thing God has ever recorded as saying is, let there be light. And then when we begin to prophesy, when we begin to confess, when we begin to come into unity and line up with Him, then we are turned into another man. Then our true self starts to come out, and our old self, which is dead and gone, just fades away, just, just really just stays buried where it was buried 2,000 years ago on the cross, or, or in your own personal life, in the watery grave of baptism, if you can hear it that way. So, cut down to 1 Samuel 10, verse 9, and it continues on with the story. It says, And it was so, that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. The most important difference, the number one difference, the only real difference between Adam and between Jesus is that Adam did not have the heart of the Father. Adam didn't know who he was. He thought he was a servant and he thought he had to earn everything he got. But Jesus had another heart. Jesus had the heart of the Father beating in his chest, beating with love. That's why, guys, that's why Jesus' blood is so powerful. Because it, can't, it, can't, it came and it comes from the heart of God. And we're going to look at this again in a minute, but, but when Jesus was speaking of the wine, he said, you know, this is my blood, the wine, the new covenant. The new covenant is Jesus. It's his blood running in our veins. And the reason that his blood runs through our veins is because we've been given a new heart. Because God gave us his heart. God transformed us from a servant to a son. He transformed us from a sinner to a saint. He came down and got us and brought us up to where he is through no effort of our own, through through no you know uh, through no deserving of our own, through through nothing of our own, but simply because he loved us and he didn't want us to be without him. He was always with us whether we knew it or not, but he couldn't stand the fact that he loved us and we didn't know it. So he said, "What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm, I'm going to transform you into somebody who can receive my love." See, a lot of people think the cross changes you into something that God can love, but that's not accurate. That's not what it is. The cross did not change you into somebody that God could love. Because God has always loved you, and He will always love you. What the cross did is it put His heart in your chest so you can receive His love, so you can know that He loves you, so that you can experience His love. Because love connects to love. The deep calls out to the deep. Uh, the Spirit speaks, you know, spirit to spirit. It speaks holy to holy. So if man has a hard hard heart, then, then God's love can't penetrate it. But if it's circumcised, circumcision of the heart, circumcision made without hands, then there's no flesh, there's no human effort, there's no earning it in the way. All of the separation is taken out, and now God can love directly from his heart to his heart. Because now it's him loving in you instead of him, you know, somewhere distant trying to love on you. And that's a big difference, loving on somebody or loving in somebody. It's the same difference between... 
you know, talking at somebody or talking to somebody. When you talk at people, they don't hear you. They just don't. You know, they tune it out and they hear, you know, the parents from Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. That's how God sounded to us before we had his heart, before we had his spirit, before we could hear him or, or, or see him or experience him the way that he truly is. That's what Jesus came to show us the Father. To say, God is not how you think he is. God is like this. And then he took it to the next level and he said, not only is God like this, but now because of the cross, God is in you. So now you're like this. So now the old has passed away and the new has come forth. Now you're a new creature because you're in Christ, because Christ is in you. So keep that, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at that again for a couple of more verses where it says, God gave him another heart. That's how God transformed us into another man. He gave us a heart transplant. He gave us a blood transfusion. He took us from where we were and filled us with himself. So it goes on in verse 10 and says, And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Something dramatic changed so that the people didn't even really recognize him anymore. Which, which, which again is exactly what happened to Jesus after the resurrection. He came to, to his own and they didn't know who he was. You know, I, I, I believe it was Mary thought he was the gardener. And, and he, different people, they didn't recognize him. He, he walked down the road and, and, and testified of all the scriptures about himself and, and the, the two disciples that were sad that he died. They, did, they didn't recognize him. Something shifted, something changed when the heart of the Father began to beat in his chest, in our chest. And that's why, again, you know, sometimes when you love somebody, they won't understand it. It won't make sense to them. They'll, they'll, they'll think you have an ulterior motive or, or they'll think, you know, you, you've gone crazy or whatever it is, but really you haven't gone crazy. You're not out of your mind. You may be out of their mind, but you're in the mind of Christ. In the mind of Christ only thinks one thing. It thinks love. The word of Lord, the Lord only says one thing. It says love. So it's okay when people don't recognize you because, listen, when, when you love somebody, one of two, I believe one of two things will, will happen. They'll either reject it real hard because they don't understand it, or they'll grab a hold of it because it's what they've been longing for, which really, even when you reject it, it's what you want. You just may not be able to see it. But when you love somebody, something will change in their life and in your life. And, and, and really, you know, at this point in this dimension, that's, that's kind of why we're here. We're here to, to, to really to infect the world with, with the love of the Father, even as He has given it to us, to just receive and release, to just be the new man that we are, rather than trying to be somebody that we're not. So it says in verse 12, And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? So even then, they could they, they immediately they went to, well, who's his father? And that was the shift, that was the difference, that was the change. All of a sudden, it's the heart of the father beating in your chest. All of a sudden, it's a relationship and not a religion. And even though people might not understand it, they will notice it. Which is why God called the people of Israel in the first place, so that the rest of the world would notice something different and would want that something different. If you tell people, come to church or else, and they see you as miserable as they are, they're not going to come. But if you, they see something in you that they want, that they're longing for, that they're craving, if they see how come this guy is so full of love, and that's what I want, but I can't seem to find anywhere, then all of a sudden you have them coming to the source, and when they come to the source, they can be filled. That's why the Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Spirit and the Bride does not say, come or else. It says, come and get it. It says, it's here, it's available. You're a new man now. You, you can satisfy your appetite to be loved, because now you can come to the source. You can, draw grad, you can draw gladly from the well of salvation. You know you're in Christ. You know you're a new creature. And now you don't have to try to be anything except just, just naturally just be who you are. So in the Message Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 10, starting with verse 9, reads like this. Saul turned and left Samuel. At that very moment, God transformed him, made him a new person. And all the confirming signs took place the same day. That's what That was type and shadow of the cross. On the cross we were transformed. We were a new person. We were conformed to the image of Christ. The work was finished. Done deal. We are made new. 
And that's good because, again, that's who the abundant life is for. The abundant life is not for Adam, it's for Jesus. And I'm not saying Adam, you know, the, the, the physical, natural human being of Adam can't have it. Because I believe on the cross, he, he, he asked Jesus to remember him or to put him back together. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm talking about a nature. It's not for the Adam nature. It's not for the old man. This abundant life is not life as we know it, but only a little bit better. This abundant life is completely a new life for a new man. It's fresh. It's new. It's exciting. It's powerful. It's what we were put here to be instead of, you know, us thinking, well, what do I have to do? So it goes on and it says, when Saul... And his party got to Gibeah, there were the prophets right in front of them. Before he knew it, the Spirit of God came on Saul, and he was prophesying right along with them. It doesn't even sound to me like Saul was trying to do anything. He was so full of that Spirit that it just poured out of him naturally. And that's how love works. You, don't, you can't try to love somebody, because then it's not really love. Love is effortless. Love is fearless. Love loves because that's what it is. Because We love because that's what we're full of. We don't love in order to be loved. We love because we are loved. And that's the biggest difference. That's the biggest shift that we have to understand. That I'm not trying to get anything because I know that I already have everything. So it goes on and says, When those who had previously known Saul saw him prophesying with the prophets, they were totally surprised. What's going on here? What's come over the son of Kish? How on earth did Saul get to be a prophet? One man spoke up and said, Who started this? Where did these people ever come from? That's how the saying got started, Saul among the prophets, who would have guessed? So now let's look at Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, and I feel like I say this every week, so I'm probably going to say it every week, but this is one of my favorite verses. Ezekiel eleven nineteen says, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. And there's a couple really, really important keys to this verse. Number one is that he gave them, God gave all of us, one heart. He didn't give you a heart and me a heart. He gave us all his heart. He brought us all into himself. We are all connected as one new man. I'm not a new man and you're a different new man. We're all the same new man. We're all different uh, uh, limbs of the same body, as it were, or, or different branches of the same tree as it were. This is a picture of unity. This is a picture of one heart for all people. And he says, and I will put a new spirit within you, the Holy Spirit, the love receptor, the, 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 the thing inside of us that leads and guides us into all truth, the thing inside of us that allows us to hear, not, you know, not Charlie Brown's parents, but our Father saying in a still small voice, it's okay. I love you. I've got your back. Don't worry about it. You don't have to fix this because I fixed it 2,000 years ago. All you have to do is see how the work got finished and then just enjoy the fruits of his labor. And that's why it's important where it says, I will give them one heart. He doesn't say, you better get a new heart. God says, I'm going to give it to you. He says, I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. All of the work, all of the heavy lifting, everything that needed to be done, Jesus did it. We don't have to do it. We don't have to try to do it. And when we understand that He did it, then it becomes silly for us to try to do it. Why would I try to do something that's already done? I come home and the dishes are done. I'm not going to try to do the dishes because somebody else already did them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to enjoy the clean kitchen. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to enjoy the life that He made for us. He wants to eat... He wants us to eat from the table that He prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. He doesn't want us struggling and, 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 and trying to take the kingdom you know, by force or by violence. That's how it was up until John the Baptist when the priesthood changed. That's how it was up until Jesus arrived on the scene and, and, and fought the war to end all wars and took care of every enemy that we could ever have. And, and, and really, again, when, when we mark the perfect man, the end of that man is peace. If you're still fighting, then you don't understand the, the peace that the Prince of Peace has secured and given to you. So what I'm saying is stop trying so hard to do all of this stuff and just understand that Jesus did it and just begin to receive it and enjoy it and release it. He says, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you. And what we just saw in 1 Samuel is how, do we, how, how are we transformed into the new man when he gave us his new heart? 
So go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, and he says it again in another way. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, in the King James reads, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. So who circumcises us? Do we circumcise ourselves? No. Do we circumcise each other? No. Jesus circumcised us on the cross with the circumcision made without hands. He cut the flesh away from our heart so that we would stop trying to use human effort to get God's love. He said, I'm going to open up your heart so you can just receive it. I'm going to give you my heart so that there's no question of love being inside of you. And look at this, I love this. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Until Jesus circumcised our heart, as hard as we would try, we couldn't love the Lord our God with all our heart. Because we still had these selfish desires, we still had this old man nature, we still had these things that we were trying to do for ourselves. Even loving God became a selfish thing. I love God more than you do. Look how much I love God. All these different things. That's not true love. That's not God's love. And he says, once I circumcise your heart, once I allow you to love me, which, which comes from Him loving us, then you can live. That was the whole point of this. The whole point of this was not God wants us to love Him so much that He's going to basically force it upon us. The point of all of this was, I want you to love me because that means that you know that I love you, and that means that you can live. The whole point of this whole deal, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what we looked at last week. That's, that's kind of what I'm building this whole... Uh, series on is Jesus was concerned with life. He was concerned with us living. He wasn't concerned with us doing things or else. He was concerned with us enjoying the, the gift of eternal life that the Father gives to the Son. That's why He opened up this door or this heart or this spirit or this mind or whatever you want to call it. That's why He opened up the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life he opened up the way so that we could know God loves us, so that we could love Him back. And therein is eternal life. Eternal life is knowing the Father and the one whom the Father sent. Eternal life is the relationship between the Father and the Son. Eternal life is love. To live is to love, and to love is to live. So without love, we can't live. That's why He gave us love. Not to be, you know, uh, 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 an, an, an end unto itself, but but to empower us to live. Love empowers you to truly live this abundant life. And again, that was the problem with the old man. He didn't know God loved him, so he couldn't love anybody else. You can't give what you don't have, and you can only give what you do have, what you believe you have, what you know you have. So he had to take us to a place where he circumcised our heart, where he gave us a new spirit, where he gave us a new heart, where he transformed us into another man, into a new man. So now we can look inside and we can see the love of the Father in there. And when we see it in there, it comes out of there. And, and that's how we live. So in the Message Bible, Deuteronomy 30, verses 6 and 7 reads, God your God will cut away the thick calluses on your heart and on your children's hearts. And I love that because sometimes it feels like we can't love because we've been hurt too many times. We have these thick scars and we, we build these big walls and we won't let anybody in because we think if we love somebody, it makes us vulnerable. And if we're vulnerable, then someone can hurt us. And, and, and who wants to get hurt? Nobody. But again, that's why perfect love casts out all fear. It takes away a fear of, you know what, listen, if I love you and I get hurt, I can't get hurt to the place where I won't love anymore because I know that even in my hurt, I'm still loved. Even if you don't love me, Daddy does. And because Daddy loves me, I can love you whether you love me back or not. I can love you whether you receive it or not, whether you care about it or not, whether you act like you want it or not. It doesn't matter. I'm not loving you for what I can get from you. I'm loving you because of what I've already gotten from the Father. So he says, God your God will cut away the thick calluses on your heart and your children's hearts, freeing you to love God, your God, with your whole heart and soul, and live, really live. Truly living is truly loving. Being loved and loving with that same love. So, now let's turn our attention to Mark chapter 2. And we're really, I really want to drive home 
that this life is not for the old man. This life is for the new man. And that's who we are, that's what we have, that's what we are capable of. So Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 15, and I'm going to read it in the Message Bible first, then I'm going to read it in the King James. In the Message Bible it says, Later Jesus and his disciples were at home having supper with a collection of disreputable guests. Unlikely as it seems, more than a few of them had become followers. And why that's unlikely is because the church world says we're not to associate with them, we're not, you know, we're to separate ourselves. So, so, but, you know, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Jesus brought people in who were ready and willing to accept what he had, rather than the religious dudes who were like, you can't give that to them, they have to earn it. And Jesus was like, no, they don't have to earn it, it's a gift. You can't earn a gift. So, it goes on and says, the religion scholars and Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company and lit into his disciples. What kind of example is this, acting cozy with the riffraff? Jesus, overhearing, shot back, Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting the sin sick, not the spiritually fit. Which was one of the keys that he tried to tell the religious dudes. He's like, your problem is, is that you think that you're okay. You don't know that you need a savior. You think what you're doing is going to get you what you want. And, and, and really, he's like, you think you can keep the law, so there's nothing I can do for you. Because the law was not given for us to keep. The law was given to bring us to Christ. The law was given to show that we can't keep it, so that when he did keep it, now all of a sudden, in him, through him, because of him, now we can get somewhere. Now I don't have to do it. Now I don't have to put all that pressure on myself, all that condemnation on myself. Now I'm not defined by my actions, but now I'm defined by who lives in me. Now I'm not the outer man or the old man, but now I'm the inner man. And now I know who's in there. So it goes on and says, The disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees made a practice of fasting. Some people confronted Jesus. Why do the followers of John and the Pharisees take on the disciple of discipline of fasting, but your followers don't? Jesus said, When you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine. And guys, again, that's what the cross was. The cross was the wedding between the Lamb and His wife, Jesus, and us. It was a wedding feast. It, 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 it was something to be celebrated and something to be enjoyed. And that's what this life is. It's, it's like, basically, it's like an, an eternal honeymoon, a divine romance between Jesus and, and His wife and His bride and His church. It's all about celebrating how good God is, how good things are, rather than looking at how bad things seem to be. Because again, if things seem to be bad, let the light shine and see them as they really are. See them through the eyes of grace, see them through the Spirit, see them through love, and, and see them as they really are. So he said, uh, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine, you feast. Later, you may need to pull in your belt, but not now. As long as the bride and groom are with you, you have a good time. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come. He went on, no one cuts up a fine silk scarf to patch old work clothes. You want fabrics that match, and you don't put your wine in cracked bottles. And now I want to read it in the King James. I like it a lot better in the King James. Mark 2, starting with verse 15, says... And it came to pass that, as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For they were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They, are, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And remember what repentance means. It means a change of mind. So if you already think you're righteous, you know, in, in, in that case, you can't change your mind. But if you know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, then repentance means, okay, let me find out what the cross was. Let me find out what the truth is, that I'm not a sinner. Let me shift away from that mindset. Let me understand that that old man who was a sinner died on the cross. Let me, you know, manifest that or appropriate that, again, through the waters of baptism, through the new birth. Where does a new man come from? From a new birth. 
which is what Jesus had when he died and was buried and rose again, and what we have in him. So, so again, he's saying, if you think you're righteous, then, then there's really not a whole lot that you're going to get from me. But if you know that you need something different, that's why I'm here, to give you something different. If you're done believing the lie, let me show you the truth. So he goes on, it goes on and says, And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and say unto him, Why did the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and they shall fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. He's saying you can't put a new life on an old man. He's saying it doesn't fit, it doesn't work, it's not going to stretch, it's going to rip, it's gonna, it, 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 you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be upset, you're going to think if I keep these rules I can have a better life, but you can't keep the rules. So you're never going to get what you want. The, you know, the carrot on the stick is going to always be just out of reach. Like Jesus said to the rich young ruler, one thing you lack. And the thing that he lacked was a heart of compassion, was the heart of God. He, 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 he was trying to earn his inheritance, and you can't earn an inheritance. You can't earn a gift. So he goes on in verse 22 and says, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. Abundant life is for the new man. It won't fit in the old man. The new wine, which again is the blood of Jesus, it doesn't run through Adam's veins, it runs through Jesus' veins. That's who we are. We're not Adam, we're Jesus. So again, it, 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 it's a mindset shift, it's a repentance, it... it, it it's a new way of looking at things where, where, where the old man doesn't have anything to do with me. The old man is dead and gone. And I'm not trying to improve his life. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, slap a coat of paint onto Adam and make him look better. I'm not trying to make life as I know it improve. What I'm trying to do is, is I'm trying to realize that Jesus gave me a completely new life. He gave me his life. He poured his wine or his blood into a new life bottle or a new vessel, a new man. He transformed me. He took me from where I was and brought me to where he is. He took me from who I was and brought me to who he is. He drew me into himself and he planted himself inside of me and that makes me completely 100% new from top to bottom. But again, you know, I believe it's the book of Hebrews, it says, we know all things are under our feet, but we don't see all things under our feet, but we see Jesus. And the more we see Him, the more everything that's true about Him becomes true about us. The more that we look inside, the more that we, that, that, that we operate from and in and for and to and by the inner man, the more this change works from the inside out. And then what's true of us manifests itself in, in this worldly dimension that we live in. Then our life is no longer life as we know it, but then it becomes abundant. Then it becomes superior. Then it becomes, you know... The, the highest quality of life you can have on every level. So now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to read a passage in 1 Peter and then a passage in Romans and then I'm done. 1 Peter chapter 3 starting with verse 1. And I'm going to read it in the message first and then the King James again. So in the message, the, uh, the heading for it is Cultivate Inner Beauty. And I like that because... Paul said, in, in another place in the Bible, he said, you know, no, no man after the flesh. He, he, he was saying, we don't judge each other by the outward appearance. We don't judge each other by acts of the flesh. So 1 Peter 3, starting with verse 1, says, the same goes for you, wives. And, and you know, again, in, in our context, we're not speaking of, of I could be a husband and, and a female could be a wife. We're talking about more the, the male spirit the husband's spirit, and the, the female soul, the wife's soul. So, so don't get confused on this, but he says, The same goes for you, wives. Be good wives to your husbands, responsive to their needs. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. What matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes, 
but your inner disposition. Cultivate inner beauty, the gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. The holy women of old were beautiful before God that way, and were good, loyal wives to their husbands. Sarah, for instance, taking care of Abraham, would address him as, My dear husband, you'll be true daughters of Sarah if you do the same, unanxious and unintimid unintimidated. The same goes for you husbands. Be good husbands to your wives. Honor them, delight in them. As women, they lack some of your advantages. But in the new life of God's grace, your equals. The new life of God's grace. It says, treat your wives then as equals so your prayers don't run aground. Summing up, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. That goes for all of you, no exceptions. And in the King James, 1 Peter starting chapter 3, starting with verse 1, reads like this. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. And I like that a lot because we always think what the world needs is Bible verses. And that's not accurate. What the world needs is love. And if you show them love, I believe it was last week I told a story about, I was talking to one of my friends about love and about relationship and about all these things. And little did they know it, but the whole time I was talking to them about God. And I didn't use one Bible verse, and I didn't choke them on Jesus, and I didn't tell them they better, you know, repent or else. I just simply, I just simply spoke what was in my heart, which is love. That's what the world needs. That they might be, uh, what does it say? Uh, that, that also they may, without the word, be won by the conversion of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, which, which again, in, in, you know, in our, our spiritual context, it means don't put on a holy face. Don't pretend to be, you know, super good, super Christian. Don't pretend to be, oh, all lovey-dovey, but then you don't really mean it. Because what's really important, it's not the outward, but it's the inward. It says in verse 4, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So he's saying it's not what you do that matters, it's who you really are. Because who you, what you do flows from who you really are. What you, you do, whatever you believe. If you truly believe that you are loved, that's what you're going to do. And you're not going to need to put on a holy face. You're not going to need to, to dress yourself up. You're not going to need to pretend to be somebody you're not. Because you're going to be secure in the knowledge of who you are. You're going to be, again, the hidden man of the heart is not going to be hidden anymore. Remember the secret garden and the wind of the Holy Spirit blows through and all the good stuff that is in there begins to come out. And then all of a sudden the secret garden is not a secret anymore. All of a sudden the hidden man of the heart is not hidden anymore. All of a sudden you're not trying to live this life, but this life is being lived in and through you. And it goes on in verse 5 and says... For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Remember the dwelling place? Remember how we do that? We know and believe. You can't believe something you don't know. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So, so the Word of God is what produces faith in us. The Word of God is what uh, releases faith in us. So it's, it's Him loving us that equips and empowers us to love anybody else. So it says, uh, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife and unto the weaker as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. And again, I like that I like that in both phrases. In the Message Bible it says, in the new life of God's grace, in the King James it says, being heirs together of the grace of life. It's a life of grace, and it's the grace of life. To live is to love, and to love is to live. It works both ways. It's all about the grace of God in our lives, empowering us to live His life, by empowering us to let Him live His life in us. So it says, uh, 
being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. Finally, be all of one mind. Remember the one heart that God gave all of the people? This is what we're talking about. It's the unity of faith. It's the unity of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the unity of I'm part of his body and you're part of his body, and all together we are him. We are the one new man. So it says, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. What does it mean to have one mind? It doesn't mean you better agree with me or I better agree with you. It means when I agree with God and you agree with God, then we have one mind together. And, and agreeing with God, again, is, is having compassion, loving one another. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. You know what Jesus said about, you know, bless those who curse you? Or maybe Paul said it, I don't know, it's in there. It says, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. What's the blessing that we inherit? It's the promised land. It's rest. It's his life. See, again, grace is, it, grace is a person named Jesus. The promised land is a person named Jesus. We are a person named Jesus. God in the flesh, love in a body. God in our flesh, love in our body. That's what abundant life really means. To, to, to be able to live it, it is only possible because God loves us, and because of that love, we can love one another. So turn to Romans chapter 8, and this is where I'm going to finish for today. Romans chapter 8, and I want to read verses 26 through 39. And in the Message Bible... Romans 8, 26 reads, meanwhile the, most, meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If you think it's too hard to love, stop focusing on loving and start focusing on the truth that you are loved. That's where our strength comes from. That's how we are strengthened in the inner man, through the Spirit, through hearing the Word of God, through knowing that Daddy loves us, so that, listen, I don't have to try to love. I just simply receive his love and, and, and release it naturally. It says, meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. How is everything in our lives worked into something good? Because it's God, it's, it's the power that's in us, uh, that's Him, that both you know wills and does of His good pleasure. It's Him working in us to do His own good pleasure. It's His love in us allowing us to love. It all comes from the source. So even if you don't know what to do, even if you don't know what to say, just let what's in there, just let it come out. Because it's love. Just focus on Him and not on the circumstances, not on, not on what you're doing, but on what He did 2,000 years ago on an old rugged cross. It says, God knew what He was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love Him along the same lines as the life of His Son. The Son stands first in the line of humanity He restored. Humanity He restored. Not humanity as we think of it. You know, not the tired, huddled masses. Not, you know, the, the quote-unquote fallen mankind. But a restored humanity, a reconciled humanity, a redeemed humanity, a new humanity with a new heaven and a new earth, a new mind and a new body, a new life. That's what we're talking about here. That's, why we, that's where we see... Uh, it goes on, it says, We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in Him. That's what it means to be restored and redeemed and reconciled. It means that He put us back together how we were always supposed to be. He brought us into Himself and He said, Now it's not about your life as you knew it, but now it's about my life as you're coming to know it. It's all about just receiving who He is in our lives so, so that we can be who He is in our lives by letting Him be Himself in our lives. It says, after God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, 
gloriously completing what He had begun. You don't have to take what Jesus did and, and, and finish it, so to speak. All you have to do is trust that He started it, He finished it. All you have to do is understand that He is both the author and the finisher of our faith. Don't put your faith in faith, put your faith in God. Because He is our faith. This, listen, uh, you know, we are crucified with Christ. Yet we live, but it's not me that lives. It's He that lives in me. The life that I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus had a perfect faith. And all my imperfect faith has to do is hook up to Him, and then His faith takes over. All my life has to do is hook up to His, and then His life takes over. All I have to do, again, is reckon myself dead. Not kill myself, because Jesus did that on the cross. But reckon myself, see myself, take an inventory and see that it's not about me, it's about Him. I'm dead, and He's alive in me. That's what abundant life is. It says, going on with verses 31, it says, So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? And the answer is, we can't. It says, if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins lifted in the scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this faces us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus our Master has embraced us. So again, what we see... The whole point of all of this is to live. And the way that we live, again, we saw last week, it, it is by eating. Jesus said, unless you partake of me, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. We eat of him, we identify with him, we get him inside of us, so to speak, even though he's already in there. We, you know, It's, it, it's the physical act of, of filling ourselves with what we've been filled with. And then when we're filled with Him, when we know that He loves us, when we believe that He loves us, then we truly live by loving each other. So in the, in the King James it reads like this, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh interception, intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And He that searcheth the heart's knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. How do you know the mind of the Spirit? How do you know the mind of Christ? You search the heart. The heart of God. The heart of God that beats with love. How do we find this heart to search it? We look inside ourselves. We look in the mirror with an unveiled face. We see the glory of God in us, and we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. It's not about going somewhere or doing something. It's simply about looking inside. It's simply about seeing what's already in there. It's simply about experiencing the love of the Father in the context of the Son. The Father loveth the Son, and that's what His Spirit is. That's what His heart is. That's what His mind is. It, 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 it's the gift that He gave us so that we can be loved and know that we're loved, and we can love out of that same love. We can love with that same love. It says, And he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And again, this is really important because again, you know, we were created in God's image. But then on the cross, it took it to a, a, another level where we were conformed to his image. Not only were we created that way, but now we know who we are. 
And again, that's this. we think this Christian life, this Christian journey, is about conforming to the image of Jesus. It's not. What it is, it's about seeing what the image is that we have already been conformed to. And the more we see it, the more we be it. The more we see Him as He truly is, the more we experience His love uh, on, a, on a personal level, on an experiential level. Not, not, you know, not saying, yeah, okay, Jesus loves me, but my life still sucks. But saying, Jesus loves me, so my life doesn't matter. It's His life that matters in me. So it says uh, that He, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's that, that word born again. He is the firstborn. He, he had the new birth. He is a new man. It's not the old, it's the new. You have to, Jesus said, you must be born again. And again, you know, Nicodemus, Nick at night said, well, what am I supposed to do? Go back in my mother's womb? And Jesus basically said, it's not about your mom, it's about your dad. You have to be born from the spirit. You have to be born from, you know, from above. You have to have the heart of the Father put in you, which, what, which is what we saw with Saul. Who's his, fa who's, who's his Father? How's this guy doing this? Well, his Father is God. And now, because of the Spirit, because of the transformation, now he knows that and he can operate in that knowledge, in that power, in that identity. So it says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God is willing to give us his Son, what is he not willing to give us? If he gave us the most important thing in the universe, which is the love of a father to a son, then, what's it, then what does he have left to hold back from us? What do we think, it, it, you know, all these blessings that we're looking for? I believe that, that to be blessed means that you know that you're loved. Because everything flows from that love. All good gifts come down from the Father of lights. We are the light of the world. He is our Father. He gives us all things, all good things. Everything that, happening, that is happening in your life, it's working together for the good. It may not always feel good, but if you get that snapshot mentality where when when you're just looking at the circumstances, that's how it's easy to fall off track. That's how it's easy to get pulled down, you know, by, by, by these earthly mindsets and these earthly remembrances, when again, all of those things are under our feet. And they have no power over us because we're already over them. You know, Revelation, it does not say, you shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. It says, we have overcome. Past tense. We don't need to overcome. We need to see how we overcame. We don't need to get somewhere. We need to see where we're at. We don't need a better life. We need to know the life that we've been given. So it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. This is what I'm saying. We don't have to conquer anything. We're more than conquerors. Jesus already conquered it, already took care of it, all, he, listen, the work, it is finished. It's a done deal. You don't have to make something happen. What you need to do is you need to figure out what already happened. You don't need to, you know, I, there's, there's this aspect of, you know, love changes things, and, and I believe that and I agree with that, but really, love changed things 2,000 years ago. And when we shine the light on how things really are, it'll look like a change, it'll feel like a change, but all it really is is a manifestation of, of, of Jesus. All it really is is, is is the revelation, the revealing of things as they truly are. We don't have to put things in divine order, we just have to see that, that Jesus already did that. 
We don't have to conform to His image. We just have to see that, that He already conformed us to His image. And all we have to do is see what that image is. We have to stop thinking, you know, pulling flower petals saying, well, He loves me, He loves me not. He loves me, He loves me not. We have to get away from saying, man, I really screwed up. I bet God's mad at me because He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. He loves you so much that He would rather die than be without you. He gave His life for you and He gave His life to you. And now, through, through faith, through knowing and believing, now He lives His life through you. And that's what abundant life really is. It's not me living any kind of life. It's not me living Adam's life or Jesus' life. It's a new wine in a new vessel. It's a new life in a new creature. It's Jesus living His life in me. I'm not doing anything except letting Him do whatever He wants to do. I'm not doing anything except offering my life as a living sacrifice and saying, Jesus, if you want to do it, do it in me. You know, just like uh, Isaiah, when he was, you know, he was preaching, whoa, 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 and then he got smacked on the lips with, with a hot coal from the altar, and then all of a sudden his speech changed. He, he was able to prophesy. He had a new spirit inside of him. And now, all, now, now the next thing he says is, you know, here I am, God, choose me. Here I am, use me. Here I am, do what you want to do, just do it in me. And that's what it means to be loved and to love with that same love. It's just Jesus loving through us. So it says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He conquered, we are more than conquerors. We don't need to conquer, we, get to, we just get to enjoy his conquering. We don't need to make peace, we get to enjoy the peace that he is. So he says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He got you. He got his love to you. He got his spirit, his heart, his mind, his new, his, his, his life. He got it to you. He moved into the neighborhood, and he's not moving out. God wanted to not, not only to dwell with men, but to dwell in men. And that's what he did on the cross. And that's where our life comes from. It doesn't come from outside, it comes from inside. It's the hidden man of the heart and the inner man. It's the Spirit of God inside of us, filling us to overflowing with his love, to the point that, that, that it's just human nature for us to love one another. Because that's how we are loved with the Father. And nothing can separate us from that love. Nothing can get Him out of us, as it were, or get us out of Him. You know, people always think, well, if you're in Christ, you can be out of Christ. But I don't think you can. I think He moved in and He's not going anywhere. I think He drew us into Himself and He's not letting us go. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So when we think about abundant life, we have to stop thinking about anything other than Jesus' life lived in us. Amen.